Is belief in the Trinity irrational? At every Sunday Mass, we profess that we believe in the Holy Trinity, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, you could even say this is the central claim of Christianity. So, every Christian begins the Christian life in baptism, being baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Every Mass begins in the same way. And this is a profession of faith in the name, the one name, of these three divine persons, of the triune God. So we could say, in a certain sense, believing in the Trinity is the very substance of being a Christian, insofar as we are consecrated by baptism in this holy and mysterious name. But to say that is not to answer the question, is it irrational to believe in the Trinity? And it might seem so. Some people might make a fairly straightforward argument, an objection that might go something like this, how can something be both one and three at the same time? That's simply a contradiction. That's not what the Christian faith is professing, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Others might add another objection. It might go something like, like this. The word Trinity isn't found in the Bible, and so uh, they imply that this belief is not a part of divine revelation. They might even suggest that it's a doctrine made up later by the church or by human beings. You'll even sometimes hear people say things like, the church didn't believe in the Trinity until, say, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which professed that the Son is consubstantial with the Father. And they want to suggest by that that somehow, before that point, there was no belief in the Trinity or no doctrine of the Trinity in Christianity. Now, all of these objections miss the mark because the doctrine of the Trinity does not profess that God is one and three in precisely the same respect. Uh, that would involve a contradiction. We profess that there is one God who is three persons, one divine essence, three divine persons. We'll explain how we can think about that in a way that isn't contradictory a little bit later. And while the term Trinity doesn't show up in the Bible, that's true, the word itself, it is true that the Bible speaks actually rather clearly about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it does so in a way that actually points us to the truth that all three of these divine persons are one God. And the church certainly did work hard over the centuries to explain its belief in the triune God, and that often took the form of excluding erroneous ways of understanding it, and so you have important councils that profess a, a further refinement or more developed uh, belief in the Trinity, but that was simply to clarify what Christianity had always believed from the start. Because for Christians, the Holy Trinity is the mystery of God in himself. And when I say that word mystery, I mean it in the strict sense here. A mystery is something that our minds cannot completely exhaust. We can begin to enter into the intelligibility of a divine mystery. We can begin to understand something of it, but we will not completely comprehend it, and in that sense, it remains a mystery to us. And likewise, as a mystery of faith, it cannot be proven by rational arguments. It depends exclusively on God's revelation, and above all, in his revelation in Christ through Jesus, who took on a human nature and lived among us, spoke of his Father, and sent the Holy Spirit to us. So, even though, as Christians, we would want to say that you cannot prove the existence of the Trinity by rational arguments or by a rational uh, proof, we would also say that it is not irrational to believe it, far from it. In fact, to understand St. Thomas Aquinas' position on this, and Aquinas has, in a way, a classic account of faith and reason, and therefore how it is reasonable to believe the truths proposed to us by faith, uh, it, it helps us to take a little detour into speaking for a moment about the relationship between faith and reason. Aquinas would say that when it comes to speaking about God, we're speaking about a mystery that is above us. 
We cannot see God face to face in this life. We can't know what God is. We can't encounter God in a kind of unmediated way because he is infinitely above us as long as we remain in this world. But we can know about God as he reveals himself to us and as we believe what he testifies by faith. And this faith is not irrational because it's quite reasonable to believe a truthful witness when that witness speaks to us. Now, we could start with even natural truths. It's very uh, important, and it's important for us in our daily lives, we do it all the time, to believe things that people tell us. We believe them even though we cannot, strictly speaking, prove that they are true or experience their truth directly. And there's lots of examples of this. I haven't been to some cities in the world. I've never been to China. Uh, and yet I believe that China is a country in Asia and the capital is Beijing and many other things about it besides because there's a very good reason to trust the word of all the other people who have borne witness to me that China is a real place. And that's a completely reasonable thing to do. But I could go to China if I needed to and verify that that place is really there. There are some things, however, that I cannot in principle verify or have access to of my, of my own. And those things may still be extremely important. They're very good, obvious examples in our daily lives of things like this. Uh, whether you like me or what you think of me, what you think of this talk right now, I can't possibly know that unless you tell me. And then you might be just trying to be nice to me. So it will be difficult for me to really get at what you think unless I believe what you are telling me. Or for that matter, if a spouse or a parent or a sibling loves you, that's the kind of thing that I cannot get inside their head to determine. And yet it's often one of the most important truths for our lives, that another person loves me. And this is something that in the end, I simply must believe because I trust the word of the person who speaks to me. And that is not irrational. It's a completely reasonable thing to do, even though there isn't a strict rational proof that undergirds that belief. Now, Thomas Aquinas has a very refined theory about this. Even as a young man uh, at the University of Paris, he wrote a work dealing with the relationship between theology and philosophy. At the time, this was a burning question at the University of Paris because there was a new wave of interest in Aristotelian philosophy. And the question was, does philosophy and theology, do they have equal claims to be present in the university? Are, there e are they equally disciplines that are worthy of study at the university level? And Aquinas' starting point for answering that question, which got him into the relationship between faith and reason and the reasonableness of believing something like that God is triune. In fact, specifically, he was commenting on a work called the De Trinitate on the Trinity. Aquinas' starting point for this inquiry is that God is the source of both faith and reason. And the human being needs both of these, both of these lights for the mind, in order to come to our final end. These two lights, the light of reason, which is given to our minds as a kind of natural possession, it's a stable possession that every human being has by nature, so that our minds are able to grasp something of the intelligibility of the world around us as we encounter it through our experiences. This light of reason comes to us as a gift from God. God is ultimately its source, even though he has given it to us as a kind of stable possession of our nature. And likewise, God is the source of the light of faith. And so because God is the source of both of these lights, he cannot be the source of a contradiction. And therefore, there can be ultimately no contradiction between what we will learn by reason or prove by reason and what we will know by faith from divine revelation, from God. 
So Aquinas has a serene confidence that reason, rightly employed, will never be able to demonstrate that a claim made by faith is false. Now, having said that, Aquinas does not think that reason will be able to demonstrate that every claim made by faith is true either. His point is that for certain truths of the faith, reason can investigate them. It can show that there is not a contradiction involved in the claim made by faith. And so it can show that it's possible to believe that claim. It doesn't involve an absurdity or a contradiction. And it also will be able to show that anyone who claims to disprove by reason that claim of faith, reason will be able to show that that proof didn't work. Okay, but that's not yet saying that reason can prove the claim made by faith. What reason can do is show that it is possible to believe that claim. And yet there will have to be some further evidence, or we might say some further credibility to that faith claim that warrants our belief in it. And ultimately, for Christian belief, we would say it is the revelation of God or the testimony of God that this is true. And that is why the truths of faith, the things that are strictly mysteries of faith, like, for example, the divinity of Christ or the Holy Trinity, these are things that we believe by faith that are worthy of belief, that are credible, and yet are not simply known by a proof from reason. Now, you might be asking at this point, well, what makes these truths believable? Why should we believe them? Well, Aquinas uh, answers se in several overlapping ways to a, an objection like this. He would say that to begin with, faith depends on certain truths that Aquinas thinks can be proven by reason. Things like that God exists or that God is one and things like that. He calls these the preambles of faith or in Latin the preambula fidei, the things that walk in front of faith. And he says that faith presupposes these truths and in a certain way needs reason to prove them. So we need to know that, for example, God exists before we can get to a belief in the triune God or a belief that God is speaking to me. We need to know that he exists. But after making that point, Aquinas points out that it's very hard for us to know even natural things adequately by our own power, by our own natural reason. So we might ask, why should we assume that if we find it hard to know things in this world adequately, even, say, things in physics or things in the natural world, things in biology, uh, things in the animal world, why should we then assume, if we have difficulty knowing those things, that we'll be able to know the things of God adequately enough to live our lives as ordered to God? In fact, there's not a good reason to think that that would be the case. So Aquinas thinks that it's important for God to teach us about himself and also to teach us about what we need to believe and do so that we can come to God. And that's actually what God is doing when he reveals himself to us. Finally, Aquinas thinks that it's reasonable to believe what Christianity proposes to us because of the special signs or proofs that God gave to confirm things like the words of Christ or the preaching of the apostles. So you might think here of, of the miracles of Jesus, his resurrection, the miracles worked by the apostles. We could also talk about the, in, the coherence of the whole truth of the Christian faith and the way it's perdured through the centuries and come down to us. This shows us that actually there is perhaps a good reason to take the claims made by that faith seriously. There's a kind of supernatural warrant being pointed out to us for considering them as believable. After saying all this, though, Aquinas, when he returns to the issue of the Trinity, says, don't try to prove the Trinity. In fact, doing so would be a big mistake, Aquinas thinks. And so, since we're here at the Thomistic Institute and we're focusing on St. Thomas Aquinas, I thought maybe tonight we would take a look at one of his texts, a text from the Summa Theologiae, where he talks about this. This is from the
the prima pars of the Summa Theologiae in question 32, article 1, and we have a PowerPoint slide to bring up for you for that. So when Aquinas begins writing about this, he says, it's impossible to attain to the knowledge of the Trinity by natural reason, that is, for our own minds to get there. For man cannot obtain the knowledge of God by natural reason except from creatures, and creatures lead us to the knowledge of God as effects due to their cause. So we can know from natural reason, in other words, that God exists, but we can't know what he is. We can know what belongs to the unity of the essence, he writes, but not what belongs to the distinction of the persons. Okay, the second paragraph on that same slide, he then goes on and says, whoever then tries to prove the trinity of persons by natural reason derogates from faith. That is, he undermines the faith in two ways. First, as regards the dignity of faith, which consists in his being concerned with invisible things that exceed human reason. In other words, when you try to prove the faith, you bring the mystery of God down into the realm of what reason is actually able to grasp, and you're liable to make a big mistake, because then you will begin to think that the supernatural mystery is something that belongs here on earth, and you will reduce it. It's a kind of reductionism, and that Aquinas thinks is very dangerous when we're talking about the mystery of God. Well, now we can go to the second slide and Aquinas' second reason here. He says, second, as regards the utility of drawing others to the faith. Now, this is actually a really interesting point that St. Thomas makes. He says, for when anyone in the endeavor to prove the faith brings forth reasons which are not cogent, that is, arguments that don't work in the end, he falls under the ridicule of the unbelievers since they suppose that we stand upon re such reasons, reasons like this, and believe on such grounds. Therefore, we must not attempt to prove what is of faith except by authority alone, and that means sacred scripture, really, or the church's doctrine, the church's teaching. And he goes on, well, as regards others who don't accept that authority, it suffices to prove that what faith teaches is not impossible. So what Aquinas means by this is that if we attempt to prove the Trinity, we will either be bringing God down to a human level and therefore misunderstanding what we're talking about. Well, we risk gravely distorting this very high mystery of God, or we will offer proofs that don't actually work. And it's worse for our case as Christians to do that. We need to pay attention to what we're able to prove and what we can't. So if you try to prove something with a proof that isn't a good one, you will end up making your position ridiculous, and it will actually mean that people will reject belief in the Trinity because you have done a poor job. So Aquinas thinks, don't try to prove that God is three and one from natural reason. Now, does that mean that we don't know that God is three and one? Far from it. No, Aquinas thinks we do know this, but we know it not from a rational proof, we know it by faith. We know it because God has revealed it to us, and this is a reasonable thing for us to believe. And in fact, even more than that, Aquinas would say that starting from the foundational knowledge we get in the Christian faith, we can begin to enter into the intelligibility of belief in the Trinity. That is, we can begin to grasp something of the divine mystery as we come to know this very deep and high truth. So that means we have to push our minds, and that's what I'm going to try to do now, to push your mind to enter into this truth and begin to, uh, even though you won't be able to grasp it fully, you'll begin to grasp something of its truth. And Aquinas has some beautiful words about this, uh, one from a disputed question that he wrote. He wrote, we hope to grasp this truth, the truth of the Trinity, in heaven when we will see God directly through his, through his essence. But even now on this earth, the ability to perceive something of the highest realities, even if only with feeble, limited understanding, gives the greatest joy. In other words, studying about the Trinity is a source of spiritual joy and contemplation. So it's one of the things that uh, always drives me crazy on Trinity Sunday if you have a preacher who gets up uh, in the pulpit at Mass, for example, and says, well, the Trinity, it's a mystery, let's move on. Uh, in fact, this is the highest and most beautiful mystery of the faith, 
It's not the easiest mystery of the faith to grasp or to probe, but in fact, it's very, very important for us to understand it. Okay, so at this point, what I'd like to do is speak a little bit about divine revelation with respect to the Trinity. And this is very important as a starting point because we've seen we can only know the Trinity because God reveals it, but also because as we begin to study the scriptures in this revelation of who God is, we begin to see that in fact the scriptures are pointing us to a very profound truth, the truth that God, the one God, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, how can we do that? Well, there's lots of texts we could look at. We're only going to look at three very brief texts here so that we can get some, some uh, handle on this. This is a little bit now, uh, uh, think of it like an archaeological investigation. What we want to do is go back to the, to the original layer, and then we're going to sort of see how things build on top of that. So if we go back to, in a certain way, the, the primitive revelation of God to his people in sacred scripture, the, the revelation of God as he is in himself to his people, where might we look for that? I would suggest we should take a look at Exodus chapter 3. And so we have a PowerPoint slide here with the text from Exodus 3. This is when Moses has the mysterious encounter with God at the burning bush. And God speaks to him and tells him to go to the people of Israel. And Moses says, and this is where our quotation here picks up, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. All right, there we get the mysterious revelation of the divine name. And this name uh, was abbreviated in the manuscripts that uh, the, the, ancient, uh, Israel, uh, the ancient Hebrew manuscripts of this passage was abbreviated with four letters. It's known as the Tetragrammaton because that mysterious name of God was so holy that they didn't even want to write it down. Later, when that Hebrew was translated into Greek, so the Greek Old Testament, the kind of standard Greek Old Testament that was in use, say, in the first century AD at the time of Jesus, the Septuagint, uh, it translated that tetragrammaton as Lord or Kyrios in Greek. And so we saw at the end of the passage in Exodus that we were just looking at that this name of God is now rendered as Lord in all capitals. And if you go through your Bible in the Old Testament, you'll find that a lot. Most Bibles have preserved that Lord in uh, large and small caps or in all caps that's actually standing in for this mysterious name of God that was revealed uh, from, the, uh, from God to Moses at that episode in the burning bush. Now, I'd like to look at the second text. This is from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 45. And what's important about this text is that we see very clearly the profession of faith of ancient Judaism that God is one. And it's connected to this one name of God, this holy name of God. If there was anything that, uh, that Judaism believed in the ancient world, if there was a creed, it was absolutely that God is one. And we, we see that here. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. The emphasis here is that there is only one God. Everything else is idolatry. So he goes on. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone forth in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, a righteousness and strength. And, and so on. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall triumph and glory. So now we have this revelation that the one God of Israel who spoke to Moses, who revealed his name, Lord, I am who am, this God stands over against all other claims of divinity. 
There is only one, and to him every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Okay, now let's fast forward to the New Testament. St. Paul was a Jew raised strictly in the traditions of his ancestors. He knew these scripture passages backwards and forwards. He professed that there was only one God. And when he became a Christian, as, he re as the, the Lord Jesus was revealed to him, he did not abandon his faith in the one God. In fact, he gives us in the letter to the uh, Philippians a marvelous statement about how, in fact, as we will see, the name of the one God belongs to Jesus. And this hymn uh, actually has a kind of V shape, as you can see from the graphic that's up there on the screen. It begins in the upper left-hand corner and speaks about the descent of the, the Son of God down to the low point, which is death on the cross. And then on the right side, you see it's picking up to his exaltation uh, to the Father. And uh, many New Testament scholars believe, actually, and I, we don't have time to go into it, but that this is the oldest single passage in the New Testament. So the most primitive words we have about the identity of Jesus. What do they say? They say this, Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men, and so forth. He humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, death on a cross. And now we get the exaltation. Because of this, God highly exalted him, and now, pay close attention, and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. Hmm, sound familiar? What name are we talking about? So that at Jesus' name, now, okay, I thought it was going to be the divine name. It's Jesus' name. Every knee must bend in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. St. Paul is making the claim that this mysterious divine name, Lord, the name which belongs to the one only God, is also the name of Jesus. Or to put it another way, Jesus is the Lord of Israel. He is the God who spoke to Moses. He is the only God. All right, now, that raises lots of questions. How can we understand that there is God the Father and God the Son, and that we're not talking about two gods, but one God? In fact, we could go even further and speak about the Holy Spirit. We don't have time to get into too much about the Holy Spirit here, but uh, suffice it to say that Scripture reveals that Jesus is the Son sent by the Father. He speaks about that often. He says things like, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and the Father is in me, and I am in the Father, and I and the Father are one. Or no one comes to the Father but by me. No one knows the Son except the Father. Things like this. Okay, very mysterious truths that Jesus uh, reveals to us. And likewise, that he sends the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of the Son. He sends him from the Father, and the Spirit gives us the power to say, Abba, Father, makes us adopted sons and daughters in the Son. Also, very mysterious truth. So we have these three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sharing the one divine name, the Lord. They are each uh, simply God. In fact, we would say that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. All three are one God. Okay. How is that possible even to think? Now, for this, I'd like to use an analogy which, uh, in a certain sense, begins from St. Augustine. St. Augustine famously came up with the kind of first beginnings of this analogy, and then it was developed and refined, you might say, by St. Thomas Aquinas. And in my opinion, this is the best created analogy for understanding how we can think of God who is one and three in this way. So, this calls for a thought experiment. Think of yourself, okay? Imagine being able to conceive in your mind 
a perfect image of yourself or of your mind, a kind of mental image of your very self. Now, what I'm after is an image of yourself that would perfectly capture who you are. Okay, that's difficult for us to do. Why? We, we don't even completely know ourselves. There's lots of dimensions of our personality that are hidden to us or that uh, we, we can discover things about ourselves. I didn't know I was angry uh, at that person. Uh, our minds are limited and very imperfect. We're creatures in time. We have bodies. We change. We have a past. We have a future. We don't know what our future will be. So it's very hard for us to get a, a perfect conception of who we are in our own minds. But I hope this thought experiment will reveal at least this much. If you perfectly, it, it, as you imperfectly understand yourself, there is something in your mind that is in a certain way from you and remains in you. And it's distinct from you as thinking it although it corresponds to who you are. Okay, now suppose that you have a perfect mind, an absolutely perfect intellect, and God, after all, is a perfect divine intellect. We could say much more about God, of course, but he is that. So God's intellect is infinitely superior to ours. In one eternal now, he understands himself in an infinitely perfect way. He conceives an image of himself, and this is what we call the divine word, the word that proceeds from the Father, and that word perfectly expresses the Father without anything left over, absolute perfection. This is the Son who is the image of the invisible God, St. Paul writes in Colossians 1.15. Now, since God is a pure spirit without a body, and his spiritual and immaterial word is also perfect, that word is perfectly identical to the one who speaks it or thinks it in eternity. It's perfectly identical in every way except for one. The divine word is God from God. He is the word from the Father. The Father conceives or begets that word in his mind, generates that word, and that word is generated by the Father. In every other respect, the Father and the Son are absolutely the same, absolutely identical, except for this distinction or what Trinitarian theology would call this uh, order between the persons, this divine relation of procession. And then we could move on to the Holy Spirit. As you think yourself and as you think of your goodness, hopefully you are good, uh, there is something lovable there. Certainly, we, we know this by thinking of someone else that we love. When there's an image of another person that we love in our minds, it arouses a kind of love in us for that person. Well, now to return to God, God is knowing himself, thinking himself in a certain way, and therefore loving himself. And this love that proceeds from God as he knows himself is the person who proceeds by way of love, that is, the Holy Spirit, who is divine love in person. Or to put it another way, the Father's Word breathes forth with the Father that love who also is perfect God. All right, now that's a very difficult analogy to wrap your mind around, but what it's trying to point out to us is that there is a way to understand one God, one divine essence, one divine nature, with three persons who are not outside of each other, but actually in a certain way simply are relations within that one divine nature or essence. In the church's early centuries, she had to confront certain wrong understandings of what Scripture teaches about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And so I'll end with this, just a brief review of a couple famous councils. The two most dangerous errors that the church had to exclude about its belief in the Holy Trinity were these. Uh, the first one is known as Arianism. It's named after a priest named Arius. The other is called Sabellianism, and that's named after its kind of original founder, whose name was Sibelius. So in 318 AD, a priest named Arius began to preach that the Son was not true God like the Father, but rather was a creature that began to exist at some point in time. I'm summarizing rather complex material, but in essence, that was Arius's view. Now, this heresy was condemned by the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD as incompatible with Scripture. What happened was you had a, a, a collection of bishops who examined this teaching of Arius and said, this is not what we believe, nor is it what we have ever believed. So we need to exclude this, uh, this claim by Arius as a heresy, as an error. And so the council developed a creed, which was a common enough thing for an assembly of church leaders to do in that epoch. They produced a creed known as the Nicene Creed, and in fact, that creed is at the root of the creed we say every Sunday at Mass, and it professes a belief that negates precisely the errors that Arius was putting forward. So it says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and in the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Those were precisely the things that Arius negated. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about in this, uh, this lecture tonight is the other great heresy that goes to the opposite extreme. It denies that there's any real distinction between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, well, how is that the opposite? Arius had claimed, really, God is just the Father. Son and Holy Spirit, they're not really God. So he said they're really distinct. And the church in the Council of Nicaea said, no, wrong, that's a heresy. Father, Son, and later clarified also Holy Spirit, these are one God. The other great heresy, Sabellianism, takes the opposite extreme and says, okay, there's really one God, but there aren't really three persons. It just sort of seems like it when we look at God or God's relation to the world gives us an understanding of fatherhood, sonship, and the Holy Spirit, but in himself there's not really a difference between them. So Pope Callistus I in about 220 AD excommunicated Sibelius for holding this view because we don't want to say that God is only a trinity related to the world or related to us. It's not that when God creates, he is Father, when he redeems, he is Son, when he sanctifies, he is Holy Spirit. He is from all eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that has always been the Christian belief. The most basic truth about the Trinity is that God is a perfect communion of persons who have the most perfect happiness. God does not need us, and yet he has created creatures not himself to invite them into the communion between these divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that we can begin to share in his triune life the mystery of infinite love of life without end, who is the triune God. Thank you. Okay, looks like we have time for a few questions. We're actually going to try a little bit of a different format tonight where we'll afford maybe 10, 12 minutes for questions uh, for Zoom and those watching on YouTube and Facebook through the live stream. And then we're going to end the live stream and then we're just going to have uh, a smaller group of uh, students associated with our Thomistic Institute chapters in Texas uh, who can stay on the call and then we'll have uh, kind of off camera, as it were, uh, question and answer. So uh, we're going to start with a live question that we have uh, on Zoom from Hannah Guth, who is coming to us from our chapter at the University of Dallas. So you can go ahead, Hannah. 
Hi, thank you so much. Um, my question is, to your knowledge, is there any necessity that there be three persons? Um, I think I recall hearing that at some point, and I don't exactly know if that's correct or why. Um, and I have a second related question. Uh, you mentioned God the Father as knowing himself, think, and the, the Son as thinking himself, the Spirit as loving himself. And I'm also wondering if there's if those three acts are what distinguish the three persons. So I guess in, in a simpler term, um, can we distinguish what distinguishes the persons or do we just know that they are three? I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Hannah, you're made to be a Trinitarian theologian. So I think you should, we need to get you to come and study at the Dominican House for Studies and we'll, we'll uh, go deeper into this because you're, you're putting your finger on uh, some very key points and, and you're already kind of intuiting how the uh, how St. Thomas Aquinas and many others uh, speak about them. So um, kudos to you. I'm I'm uh, actually that's quite impressive. Um, okay, so uh, let me start with the second question because that's the one that I uh, that I remember. I'm starting now to. Oh, the first question was: Is it necessary to say that God is a Trinity? And Aquinas and, and the Christian tradition would say uh, yes. So it's why, what do we mean by necessary? We're talking about God in Himself. Okay, so we're talking, now it's not necessary that we know that about God, and it's possible for us to, you know, to live in the world without knowing that. We can't know it unless God reveals it. But it is a necessary, absolutely necessary truth about God, who from all eternity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there is no way to think in Christian theology about like God kind of saying, mm, I think I'm going to become Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, no, that simply is the eternal reality of God, and it absolutely couldn't be otherwise. Now, you might say, well, okay, I, I don't really understand how that is so, because to me, it seems obvious that, like, maybe we could say, or maybe it's not obvious, but uh, I think we could work out a philosophical proof and say, okay, God must exist, and so we can, we can clearly arrive through the process of reason to say that there is a necessity that God be, that God exist. But can we understand the necessity for why he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And Aquinas' answer to that is, no, we cannot actually understand that necessity. We can know that it is necessarily true because he's revealed it to us. Uh, we know that it's eternally the case. But all we can do with our minds is begin to probe the intelligibility of it, like using the analogy of, of the mind thinking and loving itself. That helps us understand a little bit how we're not talking about a contradiction. Uh, and so we can, we can begin to get some handle on it. But we can't go so far as to see why it's necessary, even though we can say it, is, it must be necessary. Okay, so that's answer to the first part. Second part, you asked about the acts. Now, actually, in Trinitarian theology, we talk about what are called notional acts. Uh, so this is technical terminology. But it's trying to describe the act of knowing himself or begetting that the Father does. Okay, so the Father begets the Son. And that act grounds the procession of the sun or the, the generation of the sun. Uh, you might think of it as like speaking, the speaking of the word. Now, by speaking, we mean like in all eternity, God is knowing himself and thinking the word. Okay, so that's a one notional act. The second notional act is the father and son loving each other in eternity. So that mutual love between father and son is the source, you could say, uh, of the Holy Spirit. So the, the Holy Spirit proceeds uh, as, uh, as, you know, a, a person from, in a certain sense, that notional act of Father and Son. So you have the Father who begets, the Son is begotten, and then Father and Son spirate, that's the technical term, they breathe forth the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is breathed forth. So those are the relations in the Trinity that give rise or that ground the distinction of the persons. Okay, uh, our next question comes from Ben Roosh, who is our chapter president at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Go ahead, Ben. All right, hi, Father. Thanks so much for this talk. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask about um, uh, how we know the boundaries of what it is we can say about the Trinity. So uh, you said it's a mystery, it's something Ultimately, we can only know by faith. We have certain things in scripture, um, but then there's also some, you might think of it as more like 
uh, spe not speculative, but theologians kind of thinking and working out just what this means. And I, I guess how uh, how do we how do we work through a little bit? I'm wondering if you can comment on the boundaries um, of just you know what those theologians can say and how do we know that uh, you know when Augustine or Aquinas are you know giving this analogy about the Trinity that it at least gets at something that's true. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. So if I understand you, you're asking, okay, there are certain things that we can say are like dogmatically fixed and we, we have to, we must affirm. And then you have like theological explanations and how, where do we, where do we know the kind of boundary between them? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I think, um, you know, we could say, uh, first of all, we start, we, we start from scripture. So that's the foundation for all of the church's dogma. And we don't want to say that like the church is, uh, you know, coming up with new theories that it's imposing dogmatically, we would want to say that basically, in the end, all of this is originally uh, contained in divine revelation. What we're doing is kind of explicating it. But there are occasions when there have been serious errors that have arisen, and then the church needs to act to exclude those things, and sometimes it does that in an authoritative way. So, like in the Council of Nicaea, the erroneous view of Arius is definitively ruled out, and that's done in a kind of authoritative magisterial way, and we want to say that the church has that authority, uh, or the bishops do, you might say, or the bishops in union with the pope, if we wanted to build this out, uh, we would say the bishops in union with the pope have the authority entrusted to them by God through Jesus in order to safeguard what the church believes and, and teach definitively and exclude errors. Okay, so uh, interesting little footnote here. Traditionally, the church has been much more hesitant to uh, lay out a positive account than to exclude what is wrong. You know, in a certain way, it sounds to the modern mind, it sounds like, oh, that's uh, not very, I don't know, not very politically correct to just be always saying no, you know, like, no, that's wrong, no, that's wrong, and never actually tell you what is right. But if we think about the, uh, the church's dogmatic tradition, when you exclude the error uh, you, you are just kind of saying, well, th that is out of bounds. But you're not trying to over-determine the positive mystery there and say, oh, oh, actually, you know, I know the full answer. I'm now going to give you the full answer. So the church has actually been traditionally rather careful in saying, okay, uh, that one, that's wrong. Um, we're not necessarily going to try and explain completely what's right. But we're going to say that's definitely wrong. And then, oh, over there, that's definitely wrong. Uh, and, and as we do that, we, we are refining the church's belief. Um, okay, now theologians sometimes come along and try and propose a kind of positive explanation. And the analogy that I just gave you is, uh, of the, it's called often the psychological analogy. So it's an analogy of, of the human mind or a mind thinking itself. Uh, that analogy can be helpful for us to make positive gains in um, understanding the intelligibility of the mystery. But strictly speaking, it isn't the dogma of the, of the church. And some theologians, uh, you know, may do a better job. Others may not do a good job. And, and it's the work of theologians to, like, argue with each other over some of these things. So there's still work to be done, I, I think you could say, in kind of understanding better these analogies, uh, penetrating more deeply into it. So really, in the end, what's dogmatically required is what we find in Scripture and what ha the church has authoritatively determined. And uh, the rest is, you know, like I think Aquinas's psychological analogy is very, very helpful. And it's, um, I mean, it, it isn't at the level of dogma, but um, Aquinas is a very great uh, figure. And so it's not something you'd want to just lightly set aside because doing so might get you into trouble. You know, I think you might, you might find yourself in one of the zones of error. But, you know, that's, that's a subject that theologians can debate. Okay, we have time for one more brief question, and we're going to go to uh, a student at the Texas A&M. Uh, so, Dimitri Garlic, go ahead, Dimitri. Um, howdy, Father, and thank you for uh, having us on here. Um, so, just I guess my question kind of flows from the analogy Thomas Aquinas gave, though I think it can also get a, a bit of a another problem, I suppose. Is so in the analogy, um, the sun comes from God's full knowledge of himself is, is begotten through that knowledge. And the Holy Spirit comes through the love between that father and son. Um, given when is sort of begotten from that, given that um, 
what exactly stops the, the beginning at three persons? So beyond the analogy, like why is it only a trinity instead of like a quadrinity or pentinity or decanity or anything? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Aquinas actually also takes up this question and he says, uh, when you have a spiritual nature, a, a, a rational nature or an intellectual nature, um, so, you know, that's, that pertains to uh, human beings, pertains to angels who are also rational creatures, and then to God who is not a creature but is rational, okay, so God also has a mind. Uh, there are two faculties, two spiritual faculties of a rational nature. It's intellect and will. That's a faculty of knowing and a faculty of loving. Okay, so with God, there's no body. He doesn't, God doesn't have uh, parts. God doesn't have, um, you know, passions or emotions the way we do. Um, so uh, we're, we're moving into the realm of a pure spirit. So actually, there are just these two faculties of uh, intellect and will, and there aren't additional ones. Um, so it's in an act of intellect, God knowing himself, and an act of loving, God loving himself as he knows himself, that produces the three persons. So uh, I, I suppose you could say the most absolute answer to your question is, well, God's only revealed to us a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So uh, that's in a certain way where we start from. Uh, we don't start with this analogy and say, oh, therefore God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, it's the other way around. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because it's been revealed to us, and now theologians are trying to like do something with this and understand what it means. And so this analogy is a way for us to understand what it means, and we can understand the intelligibility of it by using this analogy and talking about the faculties, uh, you know, in an intellectual nature, but uh, which like like the divine nature. But I don't think that's strictly speaking a proof that there are only three, or even that there are three. So once again, that's a very important point that Aquinas would make: is hey, I've not proven that God is a Trinity. All I'm doing is showing that it's revealed by faith and it is believable. And in fact, uh, not only believable, but there is a certain deep intelligibility to it that as I enter into it, uh, provokes wonder. And uh, it's a subject of, of great, um, great joy in contemplating that truth. Uh, so I think that's, it, that's the best way, to, uh, the best short, short answer for that.